welcome back to the Popperian Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jedley Henry. And on today's show, we have a very interesting guest. And I think a guest that many of the listeners are really going to enjoy listening to here because uh, it may sound from the beginning that this is a simple kind of topic. But as you begin to get below that very first layer, you're going to see the huge ramifications. We're going to talk about conspiracy theories and falsehoods when it's rational to, to believe falsehoods the limits of science and what pseudoscience is, and of course, uh, what the demarcation problem is for Popper. So uh, on today's podcast, we have postdoctoral fellow of the Flemish Fund for the Scientific Research and the holder of the Etienne Vermeersch Chair at Genk University. This is Martin Baudry. Martin, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jeff. My pleasure. And uh, you've done a huge amount of research on this uh, interesting aspect of work. And I think one of the most interesting things is when we get to a stage and not too quick, not too far away when we talk about how you differ from Popper. And for me personally, that's always one of the most interesting things. So, but as a first question, we should plant a flag. What is the um, demarcation problem and why does it matter? Well, traditionally the demarcation problem is uh, the, the problem of, distinguishing uh, good science from pseudoscience. Uh, there's actually a discussion about uh, you know, what exactly the demarcation problem is. And if you go back to Popper, Popper was one of the uh, pioneers of the, of the field of philosophy of science and also arguably uh, the person who put the uh, demarcation problem on the philosophical agenda uh, and gave it its classical formulation. But there's a little bit of discussion about what exactly uh, uh, the demarcation problem is. So in, in, in my uh, publications, I, I make a distinction between what I call uh, normative demarcation, and that's the, the distinction between good science and pseudoscience. So that's, that's a normative question, uh, separating good stuff from bad stuff. Uh, pseudoscience is inherently a term of abuse, so no, no one is proudly proclaiming to be a pseudoscientist. Um, it's, it's always something that you attribute to, some, to someone else. But then there's another uh, demarcation problem, which I call the territorial uh, demarcation problem. It's also something that Popper was interested in. And initially, I think the, the, the two problems got a little bit uh, mixed up also in his writings. So what the territorial uh, demarcation problem comes down to is how to separate scientific beliefs from other forms of knowledge that are also legitimate. For example, philosophy or logic or metaphysics. Um, but I think when... When philosophers talk about the demarcation problem, then mostly they're talking about pseudoscience, about the, the distinction between uh, science and pseudoscience. And uh, even though after Popper, uh, a lot of philosophers have actually uh, lost interest in, in the problem starting, let's say, around the, the 70s or the 80s. Uh, there's a very influential article by uh, Larry Lauden, uh, who proclaimed the demise of the demarcation problem, who said, actually, I mean, there's no such thing as pseudoscience. It's just a a hollow phrase. Uh, there's no way to distinguish uh, science and pseudoscience in, in any general way. Um, uh, but, 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 but I think it's, it's, it's still a problem that is very much important for society at large. And, and you see that, I mean, the, the, the problem hasn't gone away. Um, there's, there's a lot of pseudosciences in our society. And, um, and people still use the term, even though philosophers, I mean, in philosophy, it has a little bit fallen out of favor. But, um, I mean, typical examples of pseudoscience uh, include things like creationism, astrology, uh, perhaps also psychoanalysis, something that Popper also wrote about. It's a bit more controversial. Um, so, and the, 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 the demarcation problem is about, okay, so we have these sciences on the one hand and the uh, pseudosciences on the other hand. Um, how exactly should we separate the two? Is there any general way to, uh, to distinguish one from the other? And so even though most uh, philosophers nowadays would say, no, there isn't. I mean, you, have, you just have to evaluate them on a case-by-case on -case basis. I do think that, um, that there are some general symptoms, I call them, uh, to diagnose pseudoscience. And in some ways, I'm also still a bit of a Popperian because Popper's solution to the uh, demarcation problem was fairly simple and straightforward. He said um, that uh, scientific theory, scientific hypotheses, always need to be falsifiable. So 
um, it should be possible to refute a scientific hypothesis or a theory by some uh, potential observation. So it should rule out certain states of affairs. If a theory doesn't do that, so if a theory is compatible with all sorts, uh, all possible observations, then it's unfalsifiable and therefore uh, pseudoscientific. Now there's a whole uh, uh, range of problems with, I mean, the way that Popper develops this idea, but I think at bottom he was onto something. Uh, we, we can, you know, I, I can expand on that, but so the demarcation problem is the distinction between science and pseudoscience and uh, and Popper was arguably you know the most influential uh, philosopher in that in that you know in that field he was the one who who actually started the whole discussion in a way so that is a great start there so I'm gonna step us forward here and we will get to that um, interesting thing of just what you think Popper did right despite being perhaps misguided here um, but let's walk into where you think this is interesting or your particular theory of um, the demarcation problem. And it, in some ways, it's a theory of what pseudoscience is. And I'm going to go from one, I think, a recent article of yours. And you write that uh, though for, uh, there is a real disagreement within the world of philosophy of just how you distinguish science from pseudoscience. Um, a massive disagreement. There is actually a large, larger agreement underneath all of this. And that is almost everyone agrees what a pseudoscience is when they see it. So as you said, home homeopathy, creationism, phrenology, things like this. And from this, you begin to build up a, a theory of, um, I suppose, a more naturalistic kind of theory. So why uh, take, take us to that dichotomy and begin to build up um, where you differ from Popper. Yeah, so, so you're right that, um, I mean, there's a huge philosophical disagreement about uh, the criteria we should apply to carry out the demarcation uh, project. So, you know, falsifiability or something else. But then, surprisingly, uh, there's actually a large consensus about particular cases. So, you know, I, I would guess 99.9% .9 of all philosophers would agree that uh, young earth creationism, for example, well, is not scientific, or at least, you know, doesn't have any epistemic merit, if you want to call it like that. Uh, and the same goes for astrology and for all these other uh, theories. There are borderline cases, of course. Uh, philosophers, uh, philosophers disagree about um, evolutionary psychology, for example, or string theory. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not always black and white, so you have uh, intermediate cases as well. But when it comes to the prototypical cases of pseudosciences on the one hand and sciences on the other hand, things like, you know, relativity theory, evolutionary theory, uh, almost all philosophers agree on, on the particulars. And then, of course, I mean, that's, that's something to... That 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 needs that that needs an explanation in the first place. Mm. Uh, how is it that people arrive at all the at, at these similar conclusions? Now, it's uh, it's uh, in a way it's it's a, it's appealing to think that um, if philosophers disagree about the particulars, then deep down that they're somehow applying the same criteria, even though they haven't explicated them. Uh, yet or not fully yet, um, but that's not necessarily so. It's it's also possible that the the, the epistemic defects of these theories, uh, creationism, astrology, uh, something like Holocaust denialism, are very different in each particular case. But but the defects are all serious enough to justify the label of pseudoscience. That would be one thing. I mean, then pseudoscience would, would, would be kind of a catch-all term just to refer to all these theories that are deficient in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, that would make the, the, the concept of pseudoscience interesting, but not very interesting from a philosophical point of view. It would be more interesting, interesting of course, if there are certain commonalities between these pseudosciences. And uh, it would be more interesting still if you could use these commonalities as uh, to diagnose pseudoscience. So say you, that, that you're uh, dealing with a new theory that you don't know how to class classify yet. And, and you know 
uh, what telltale signs to look for and say, well, if you see this or if you see that, then it's uh, likely to be a pseudoscience or it's likely to be um, a science. So what I do in my paper is um, I'm actually naturalizing the demarcation problem in the sense that I'm not trying to find like a general timeless a priori uh, definition of science and then derive a definition of pseudoscience from that definition. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the particulars the things that we all agree on, astrology, uh, creationism, Holocaust denialism, uh, homeopathy, and try to look at recurrent patterns. Like, what is it about these theories that, uh, that makes them into pseudoscience? Why is it that, for example, there's a, when, uh, when, when, a, when a paper defending astrology just uh, is published in a scientific j journal, then there's a huge outcry. I mean, and some, oftentimes the paper is detracted. So everyone seems to agree that, I mean, this is not, this is discredited. This just doesn't belong here. Um, and then, so, uh, you know, I go through a whole uh, series of steps in the, in, in the paper. And um, what, I'm, what I'm actually uh, getting at is that um, the, when, you, when you try to define pseudosciences, uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, relying on the work of uh, uh, Sven Uwe Hansen. He's a Swedish mm. philosopher of science. And um, he gave a very nice uh, def meta definition in a way of pseudosciences where he says, look, pseudosciences are doctrines. I mean, they're theories. They're not just like loose hypothesis ideas. They are part of well-formed doctrines like creationism or uh, homeopathy. Uh, they are not epistemically warranted. So for some reason, I mean, <laughs> something has gone wrong. That's, that's for sure. And they try to create an impression of being scientific, of being epistemically warranted. Uh, I mean, this is just ba basically the etymology of the term. Pseudo derives from the Greek word for false or fake. So it's a theory that is presented as scientific by its defenders, uh, but, that, but that doesn't have a re uh, any scientific merit uh, at all. Now, most philosophers have tried to look into the, the second criterion, the, the one about epistemic warrant, and try to find out, well, what is it? What, like, can we give a general account of epistemic warrant and then what it means to be not epistemically warranted? And that gives us, a, like an, uh, that gives us an account of what, what pseudosciences are. But I think that's, that's kind of a dead end because, I mean, there's, uh, given the heterogeneity uh, of, the, of the sciences, there, there's a lot of different ways uh, in which things can go wrong. I mean, in the medical sciences, uh, the standards for evidence are fairly different uh, when compared to the historical science or to physics, etc. Uh, so I, I don't. I think it's very hard to come up like with a general definition of of epistemic warrant. Um, and a fortiori, uh, when it comes to uh, lack of epistemic warrants, because I mean, uh, this is just like a. a, a, a very general um, thing about the, uh, about the world that there are always a lot a lot more ways to do things wrong than to do things right. Uh, so pseudosciences may be deficient, may you know uh, commit errors or fallacies or um, uh, or mistakes in any number of ways, and it's very hard to come up like with a general characterization of all these uh, of all these things. So what I'm doing is rather than looking into the second criterion, I'm uh, looking into the third criterion. So the third criterion was pseudosciences are theories that try to create an impression of epistemic warrant. This is crucial. Like uh, regardless of the domain, whether it's in physics or in biology or in history, all pseudosciences are confronted with this problem. Well, they're not epistemically warranted. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's really no evidence for these theories, but still they try to create that impression. They have to because they need to fool people. They need to fool people into believing that, hey, wait a minute, this is, this is like a real scientific theory. Um, so they do that in all sorts of ways. Uh, they, they, for example, they establish scientific journals, uh, they hold uh, fancy uh, conferences, they use technical jargon. Uh, so they imitate science in all sorts of ways. Uh, now, there, these things are fairly easy to imitate, so they're not really useful for demarcation uh, purposes because, I mean, it's easy to establish a scientific journal. That doesn't make you scientific. Uh, but there are some things that are harder to fake than others. And epistemic warrant, I think, is the hardest thing to fake uh, of all. And that's, that, that's actually the strategy in my paper. So I try to look at the strategies that pseudosciences use 
to create this impression of epistemic warrant and in particular um, to evade critical tests and refutations. And this is where the Popperian dimension comes in. Um, because it, it, it's true that if, if a belief system is to survive, if a belief system is, is to win converts, um, it should somehow be able to steer clear of refutations, of counter evidence. Uh, because by definition, if it's a pseudoscience, it doesn't have any proper evidence. I mean, uh, scientists can afford to, to make their theories vulnerable to, to refutation because, you know, they, they're really tracking some objective patterns in the world. And so um, that, that, that makes their theories falsifiable in Popper's terms. Um, but all pseudoscientists need to do the opposite. They need to steer clear somehow of uh, refutations while simultaneously also seeking out some uh, confirmations what I call spurious confirmations. Um, and so there are only a couple of ways to achieve that. And, and so what I do in my paper is I give a list of strategies that you see um, across really different pseudosciences. And, um, and the, the, the most important being uh, what I call immunizing strategies. So these are strategies the, devised by pseudoscientists to... Um, immunize themselves against uh, refutation. So the, my favorite is perhaps the one that was devised by, uh, by Sigmund Freud. Uh, Sigmund Freud had this brilliant immunizing strategy according to which uh, people who criticized his theory were actually confirming the predictions of the theory. Mm -hmm. Because according to Freud, uh, we're all under the spell of this unconscious. Unconscious is a hidden entity, uh, like uh, buried deep beneath uh, our uh, uh, conscious mind uh, that is full of uh, forbidden desires and um, uh, perversions and uh, and it is an intentional entity it's something that is capable of you know having uh, intentions and desires etc and uh, one of the predictions of psychoanalysis is that um, this unconscious wants to remain hidden it doesn't want to be exposed and so what Freud says is that um, our unconscious resistance against psychoanalysis disguises itself as a sort of intellectual criticism. So people will start criticizing psychoanalysis for intellectual reasons, but what they're really doing is that they're, they're, um, you know, they're being driven by these un unconscious desires to refute the theory because they don't want their <laughs> Oedipus complex to be exposed, for example. Um, so it's a brilliant strategy because it's, like uh, it, 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 so it, it turns around uh, any kind of criticism into a confirmation of, uh, of psychoanalysis. So, so that's a cute little thing. It's, it's an immunizing strategy in psychoanalysis. But what I do in the paper is that, is that I, I show that these things crop up in virtually all pseudosciences. So all pseudosciences use these kinds of tricks and they have to. I mean, it's the only way for them to survive because they don't have any real evidence. So to make a long story short, what I'm doing is um, I'm looking at the ways in which uh, pseudosciences um, protect themselves against unwelcome evidence. And in this way, um, try to create an impression of, uh, of epistemic warrant. And by, you know, by giving a list of these immunizing strategies and other uh, ad hoc maneuvers, etc., cetera, um, I think, I also come up with something that is useful for diagnostic purposes. Like if you're confronted with a new theory and you see that someone is engaging in these immunizing strategies, even if you haven't looked into all the evidence, you can be pretty sure that there's something fishy, that it's probably a pseudoscience. Um, I can go into why, uh, so how that uh, relates to uh, Popper's ideas and how it's different from Popper's ideas, but uh, it's oh, already a long answer, so well, I'll stop there. <laughs> well, say, save Popper for one more question in a second here, but I do want to add uh, one thing to this, which is important for listeners who are trying to understand um, this direction. It, importantly, you're not saying that um, if, um, for example, a, a, a pseudoscience or a theory falls into one or two of these categories, then it is automatically a pseudoscience. What you're not drawing here is drawing a hard boundary. It's more of a, an accumulation of evidence, like a, um, a court of law, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's right. Because, I mean, 
One of one of the well, so I am getting into popper again now. So one of the problems with with uh, traditional falsification is that it doesn't account for things that really happen in scientific practice in in, in good sciences. Um, so real scientists are not really strict falsificationists. So when they discover something that seems to uh, undermine their theory, an apparent anomaly or refutation. If it's a really successful theory, they don't really throw it overboard right away. Uh, what they're going to do is they try to see, well, is there something about the, uh, the I mean, the uh, the instruments that we devised about the ex experimental setup? Is there perhaps some some uh, auxiliary hypothesis that is to blame? Um, because it's 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 really hard to figure out exactly what what goes wrong when it, when an experiment fails or when an experiment gives you know a, a surprising result. And so uh, what I think we need to do is um, we have to give scientific theories some leeway, is what I call them, in um, dealing with apparent refutations. So uh, the problem uh, with, with the concept of immunizing strategies is that to some extent, this also happens in real science. Like, uh, well, this is, this is a famous example of uh, new, uh, about Newtonian theory, um, where uh, at some point, uh, I think in the 19th century, it was some there was some anomaly in the uh, in the orbits of uh, Uranus that was discovered and that seemed to you know uh, refute Newtonian theory. But physicists didn't you know they didn't just throw overboard the whole of Newtonian physics because it was so extremely successful. And they said, well, you know, there was probably something that we didn't account for, uh, some, uh, you know, some fudge factor in the equations that, that, that we need to figure, figure out later on. And then eventually what, what was discovered is that there was another undiscovered planet that turned out to be Neptune, but that was called Neptune, uh, that accounted for these perturbations in the, in the orbit of, of uh, Uranus. Now, a strict Popperian would have said, well, uh, here's a refutation of the theory, so that's too bad. <laughs> we have to stop doing Newtonian physics now. Of course, that's not what happens. So in a way, you could say that the physicists were protecting Newtonian physics by saying by by coming up with this sort of ad hoc uh, move. And um, any realistic theory of science of scientific uh, you know scientific progress needs to account for these sorts of things. So. You're right that when I'm talking about uh, immunizing strategies, at uh, ad hoc maneuvers, etc., it's not like a, a single ex example that will kind of that is definitive or that will clinch it. It's more like an accumulation of these kinds of strategies, like very persistent, uh, very general strategies, not like a single ad hoc move to to explain away a single anomaly, for example, but like very general uh, immunizing strategies, like the one that uh, that I just explained. Uh, uh, in uh, psychoanalysis. So this argument, uh, this resistant argument that Freud developed, well, you can apply that everywhere. You can, I mean, any kind of criticism can just be explained away, but oh, it's just unconscious resistance, so we don't need to take it seriously. Um, and and so what, what my theory, uh, uh, what, what, well, what my philosophy of science tries to do in a way is, is um, also account for these intermediate cases. Uh, there are certain certain theories that, in a in a way, degenerate into pseudoscience. You know, they start out as kind of legitimate sciences, something like phrenology in the nineteenth century, like the, the theories about the, the shape of uh, someone's skull and the, you know, the the, the bulbs and and um, uh, that 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 are associated with certain personality traits. Um, I mean, at some point, it was perhaps a legitimate scientific hypothesis. But then it kind of degenerated into pseudoscience because this phrenologist needed to come up with uh, ever more elaborate and far-fetched ad hoc hypotheses to explain away all these apparent refutations. And is it possible to say, to pinpoint exactly when it degenerates into pseudoscience? Well, perhaps not. It's a gradual thing. It's, just, it's, just, it's like a slippery slope. And, um, and it's, you know, at some point, it can be... Uh, it can be kind of a gray area between science and pseudoscience. But that doesn't mean that there, there are no black and white cases. So when it comes to a theory like astrology or creationism, there's really no discussion there. It's, it's so 
persistent, um, these immunizing strategies, these ad hoc uh, moves, etc. So creationists, for example, need to come up with ad hoc hypotheses to explain every new piece of fossil evidence. So mm. it's really like uh, it's 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 not even close. It's and that's also the the reason why all I mean the large majority of philosophers agree that uh, creationism is pseudoscience. They only disagree about the criteria to find to to uh, to make that distinction. So, but you're right that it's um it's a it's an accumulation of these um of these immunizing strategies uh, that should f- serve as sort of warning signs. Like if you see this one time, okay, it's a little bit suspicious. If you see that uh, twice or three times, etc. if you see people coming up with these uh, strategies over and over again, eh, you can be fairly sure that you're, you're dealing with a pseudoscience or with something that has degenerated, degenerate into pseudoscience. So I should get you to touch on an important question here, and I might quote uh, Lakatosh here, and it might uh, clear up for, in people's minds just um, why it is so hard to have that kind of strict um, falsificationism that Popper hoped for and thought good science was always doing. And Lakatosh writes here, I'm going to quote him, it's not that we propose a theory of nature, and so it's not, it's not that we propose a theory and that nature shouts back no. Rather, we propose a mass of theories and nature may shout back inconsistent. And this is the challenge here is it's, it, it, it appears to be, I'm, I'm going to get you to clarify, of course, and clean up my mess here. But uh, just this seems to be that, that one of the larger problems with, with um, Popper's falsificationism, that is uh, we can join these auxiliary assumptions, these boundary conditions, all this background knowledge and our scientific theories never really make contact with reality. It's this long chain of theoretical knowledge. So how do you know what is being falsified at each point? Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, it's, it's also, it's a wonderful uh, quote by Lakatosh. I, I also love it. Um, uh, and it's, uh, well, it's, it's very much applic- applicable to the, to the example I just gave about uh, Newtonian physics and, and the discovery of mm. Neptune. Yes. Uh, it's, it's not that this anomaly in the orbit of um, Uranus falsified Newtonian physics. It's not that nature shouted, no, Newtonian, Newtonian physics is, is incorrect. It's that Newtonian physics conjoined with uh, certain, with telescopes, experimental setup, uh, background knowledge, uh, auxiliary hypothesis about all the, you know, all the other different planets that affect the orbit of uh, Uranus, all these things together somehow is inconsistent. I mean, there's something wrong here because the observation uh, is different from, from what was predicted. And then, of course, it's a matter of finding out what is to blame. Sometimes it's the theory itself is to blame. Sometimes it's just the telescope that is malfunctioning or uh, something uh, like one factor in the equations that you hadn't accounted for in this case. Uh, this undiscovered planet. Um, so I, I do think that Lakatosh is a huge improvement over the original uh, falsificationism um, that Popper devised. Although, I mean, you could, to give Popper some credit, you could also say that Lakatosh was actually elaborating on some ideas that were already implicit in Popper. I mean, there's a, there's a question to be there's a discussion to be had about whether Popper really was such a strict naive falsificationist. In any event, Lakatos um, really developed sophisticated falsificationism um, to a much larger extent than uh, than, than Popper did. Um, in a, so in in that sense, my approach is closer uh, closer to to, to Lakatos' idea of a, of a the. the you know, uh, progressive theories versus degenerative theories. So the word degenerative actually was also used by by Lakatos to explain why a research program, by coming up with ever more ad hoc moves, degenerates into pseudoscience or into bad science. Um, The only only problem or the only um, criticism I I, I would have with respect to Lakatos is that... um, what Lakatos was still um, trying to do, and that's very much in the spirit of Popper, is to diagnose science versus pseudoscience in terms of the theories themselves and their logical relation to certain observations or to certain 
uh, observation statements is, is, the, is, is the technical term. And well, my criticism would be that when you look at pseudoscience, it's often very hard to tell where exactly the theory as such ends and where like the evasions and um, excuses of its adherents begin. So take the example of Freudian psychoanalysis again and the resistance yeah. argument. Well, is that just Freud who is just uh, engaging in, in a fallacious or self-serving, you know, circular form of reasoning where he's already assuming the the truth of, of the theory uh, to begin with, or is it something that is inherent in the theory? Well, it's hard to tell the difference because in a way, Freud is right that it does follow from his theory that if we have such, you know, if all of us have this thing called the, the uh, psychoanalytic unconscious and if this is an intentional entity and if this is something that is um, taboo or forbidden for the unconscious, so it's something that has to remain hidden. And, uh, and if this unconscious engages in all sorts of clever strategies to... Uh, you know, to sabotage our investigation in a way, then yes, you would indeed expect that the critics themselves would be under the spell of this unconscious. So um, what, I, what I write in the paper is that uh, in, in the murky hinterlands of science, what I call <laughs> them, so when it comes to pseudoscience and, and related things, it's, it's really hard to apply the kind of strict logical uh, approach that Popper uh, uh, promoted and also that Lakatos adopted to some extent. Lakatos was really looking at like a research program. A research program is a certain collection of uh, hypotheses and, um, uh, and, and, and methodological practices and background conditions, etc. And then Lakatos was trying to figure out for every move in that game, is it progressive or is it degenerative? So, for example, Lakatos would say, well, you can make an ad hoc move in a research program, provided that certain conditions are fulfilled, provided that it leads to new predictions, for example, provided that, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so he was, he was always very much um, interested in the theories themselves. And I think it's, that's uh, fine as, as far as it goes when it comes to proper sciences, when it comes to physics, for example, or biology. Uh, but when it comes to pseudosciences, you, that's, you're kind of, uh, these, these kind of distinctions are slipping away from you, um, but, uh, you know, precisely because it's so murky, because it's so <laughs> confused in a way. Um, so what I'm saying is, is I'm, I'm actually, I'm developing a Popperian idea, the idea of an of a unfalsifiability is, is a Popperian idea, of course, but whereas Popper and also Lakatos try to, uh, uh, interpreted unfalsifiability as a logical property of the theories, I'm more interested into the behavior, into what, what the advocates of these theories do. And uh, so an immunizing strategy, in a way, is a way, is a way to render a theory unfalsifiable. But what makes creationism unfalsifiable, unfalsifiable is not so much like the logical relations of these propositions, of these hypotheses. It's more the persistent behavior that these... Um, creationists engage in to protect the theory from refutation and this was something that popper was very wary of like he uh, he has this term uh, psychologism and he said no w mm. when when we're solving the demarcation problem you really have to look at the theory and like because it's a logical thing it's a, it's a theoretical thing and um you should uh, you should abstract away from the people who are defending the theory and so uh, in a way I'm doing exactly what Popper warned yes. against. I'm looking yes. at, uh, at, the, at the theorists themselves. And, uh, and you know, and because I think pseudoscience is also, it's very much a psychological thing. It's, it's not just a, it's not like a general timeless thing that always existed. No, it's something that uh, emerged in a certain period of time. Something that also, it's parasitizing on science because, I mean, astrology, of course, already existed for millennia, but it only developed into a pseudoscience after the rise of astronomy, because then it was emulating something that was, that was there. It wanted to become a science. And um, in order for 
pseudoscientific theory to be successful, I mean, to be culturally successful, uh, because astrology is very much successful in that sense. I mean, it's still, there's still millions of people who believe it. Um, it needs to be also psychologically plausible. And so I think you have to look at the, the psychology and the sociology as well of the people who believe it and the people who develop these, uh, these theories. So in that sense, I am uh, taking a distance from, from the original falsificationism uh, as Popper defended it and also Lakatos. Which of course uh, sends me into the next question here. And this is an interesting question. There's something you touch on in your paper again, that um, if we follow you here, and of, of course it's a, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, this idea that analyze what pseudoscientists and pseudosciences actually do uh, to understand what a, what a pseudoscience is. You actually argue that there's still a, a pressing question here of just why, if Popper was wrong, uh, so many f people uh, found him so persuasive, his, at least his expression of what this uh, demarcation problem was. And you write that this is because there was this, this important kernel of truth l uh, lurking within Popper's understanding of science. And it wasn't so much ex explicitly what he said, but rather this, and I think I might quote you here, good scientists stick out their necks because they can afford to do so. And I thought that that was a, a great little explanation of why Popper uh, had touched on truth, even if he didn't have the whole truth. Yeah, that's, that's right. It's so, so it's, it's funny that, uh, I mean, this is something that frustrates a lot of professional philosophers. I mean, it doesn't frustrate me, but um, the fact that Popper, despite all the philosophical objections that, are, that have been leveled against his falsification is still very much of a, you know, as a, of an influential figure among working scientists. Like if you ask a working scientist about what his philosophy of science is, a lot of, a lot of them would still quote Popper and say that that's the guy, that's the spirit. You know, you have to always look for falsifications of your theory uh, and, and uh, science is always uh, fallible, etc. So they, they will, they, they have, somehow um, adopted these kinds of little nuggets of insights that, that, that were really lurking in there in, in, in Popper's uh, uh, falsificationism. But what is interesting is also that they have distorted Popper's views in a more reasonable direction. And, th and that really I think is, is, uh, is even more interesting because the things that they didn't take, uh, take away from Popper um, and that they perhaps are not even aware of, or also the, exactly the things that are problematic. For, for example, many scientists, even the scientists who, uh, you know, who uh, admire Popper, are not aware that according to a strict Popperian, a th scientific theory can never be confirmed. I mean, no matter how many observations you find that, you, that are consistent with the theory, you know, that fail to falsify it, you can never say that the theory becomes more probable. It's a very counterintuitive idea, and it's also something, I mean, it <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Uh, but this is because Popper was really beholden to a strict deductivism. He only wanted deduction as a way to make progress. And deduction only works with falsification. So you have, a, you know, the, the, the typical toy example is the theory that all swans are white. Uh, and no, no matter how many swans you find, the theory never becomes probable because induction uh, you know that, that, that that's that's all that would be an inductive interest and inductive inferences are not accepted by popper but finding a single black swan immediately by deduction falsifies the whole theory or the whole generalization um and that's how you make progress so now the interesting thing is that this is something that many working scientists are, are not aware of um and rightly so because i think it's, it's one of the problematic aspects of, uh, of Popper's theory. Uh, strict, the, the, the problem with strict falsification is also problematic because even though many scientists may pay lip service to the idea that like, oh, a one refutation suffices, like it's, uh, if I find one refutation for my theory, I immediately uh, <laughs> throw it in the dustbin. But actually they don't. It's, it's not how science works. And if you, and if you see, like if you, if you catch scientists in their really, like their actual scientific work, you'll see that this is not what they do. Um, so there's this famous example of a, I think it was a Dobzhansky or some biologist who was asked like, a, what would be a refutation of a evolutionary theory? And he said, well, 
if we if we discovered a rabbit fossil fossil in the pre in Precambrian uh, Precambrian rocks, so hundreds of millions of years before mammals evolved, well, that that would be that would be the end of uh, evolutionary theory. And it's a nice like it's a nice it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a very appealing sort of rhetoric. Like see how it's a kind of her heroic stance of just give me one piece of uh, of evidence that refutes my theory and I give it up immediately. But of course that wouldn't happen. And, and I think, it, and, and if, if science scientists are, are really thinking it through, I think they would realize that this, this won't happen. The first thing that you would, that you would think of if such a fossil was discovered is that it must be fraudulent. I mean, there must, there must be something, somebody or some, somebody must have misidentified it. Mm. They think it's a rabbit, but, but it's not really a rabbit. Um, or some, or perhaps there was an animal back then that superficially resembled a rabbit. Or perhaps there was something with the, the geological uh, layers that have been uh, upturned or whatever, and so that the, a rabbit ended up where it didn't belong or something like that. Um, this is what would really happen if something like that occurred. So the idea of strict falsificationism is, uh, doesn't make any sense. But the general idea, what I call the kernel of truth in, uh, in Popper's philosophy, the fact that you um, make yourself vulnerable for potential refutations, even though it's not a single refutation, maybe it's just like a, like a cumulative weight of, of, uh, of refutations or anomalies, that is a very important idea in science. Um, and I do think that what makes evolutionary theory so strong, so impressive, is that there are literally millions of ways to attack the theory. There are millions of ways in which some, you know, th the theory can be uh, undermined, not by a single instance, but still all sorts of fossils. And time and again, we see that everything still confirms theory. So, so all, all, all new fossil findings still fit within the, within the general framework of ev evolutionary theory. And that is very much an, uh, an important distinction with pseudoscience because pseudoscientists don't do that. They don't stick out their necks. And the reason, of course, I mean, it's when you think about it, psychologically, it's fairly obvious. They can't afford to stick out their necks because their necks would be hacked off <laughs> right away. <laughs> if a creationist would stick out its, its neck, I mean, it's, it's, the theory would be, would be undermined immediately. So they have to find some way to evade uh, criticism. So, and... What I'm trying to do in the paper is, is also rescuing what is valuable uh, in Popper's philosophy, um, explaining why it is that it's still so popular among uh, working scientists, um, and um, but without taking on some of the baggage that uh, you know that, that made it indefensible. The deductivism, for example, I don't buy that. Uh, the strict logicism, when you're only looking at the logical relationship between theories and, and observations, that's that's very much outdated. But the general idea, uh, the, the things that Popper wrote in, uh, about psychoanalysis, for example, about astrology, about Marxism, uh, in, a, in a more kind of loose way, um, he was not really talking about strict logical relations there, and, and he was kind of more of a in, the, in a falsificationist spirit, uh, without really sticking to the to, the, to 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 his to his doctrine, to his philosophical doctrine, was really insightful, and he and and I think it's an old idea, uh, but Popper was one of the first one to really to develop it, and it's it's not a coincidence that. Uh, at the very beginning of my paper, I use a quote from Thomas Paine, which is, of course, much older than, uh, Pop uh, than Popper's philosophy. Uh, I don't know exactly how old it is because I haven't, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly when he said it. Uh, and the, 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 the quote is, uh, if I remember it well, it, it, is, uh, it is error only and not truth that shrinks from inquiry so that, you know, that uh, evades inquiry or evades uh, investigation. I think it's a very Popperian idea. And it's a, in a way, it's in a nutshell, the idea that I develop in, in my paper. Um, so I do think it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good idea. It's a, it's a plausible idea. It's, it's something, as, as all good ideas, that it's not, it's not invented by someone. It's, there's always predecessors, etc. Um, but, but Popper, 
deserve some credit for you know being the first one to really make it into the basis of uh, of the scientific worldview of the scientific attitudes. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far, and I apologize for this brief interruption, but I will take this moment to briefly send out a plug for the podcast itself. The Popperian podcast is something that I've been planning for quite a while, and it's something that I want to keep running month to month. But to do so, it's going to need your help. If you're willing, or able, or interested, please go to the links below the podcast and support us however you can. It will be your help as listeners that keeps the podcast going, and keeps the content coming out, and I thank you in advance. And with that said, we will now return to the second half of the interview. Thanks for listening. So let's shift direction just slightly from that. It it does flow on though. It's in a different paper of yours. And it's an important question. And the question then comes from then, if this is what pseudoscience is, then what exactly is science? And the important question that you ask here is, are there any limits to science? And of course, what brought in, what comes into this immediately is the question of scientism. And there's all, you run through a whole range of questions and interesting thoughts of where people may or may not draw the boundary or how they describe it. But all too often you write, that when people are, uh, are dismissing something as uh, scientism, often what they're saying is, and I'm going to quote you here, uh, it boils down to science I don't like. And, but it, it, it is still a very interesting question here because uh, my original thought of science was slightly different uh, to yours when I was reading this. And I realized I, I, I didn't quite have it right because I had some conception of, of building knowledge here. But you write, my plumber may be quite adroit at investigating a leakage, but I would not call him a science. So um, it's a broad question, but what are the limits of science and what is the place for scientism? Yeah, it, it's a broad question. And actually, it, it harks back to something that I said at the very beginning. So um, we've been talking about the demarcation problem, which is the normative demarcation problem, uh, the distinction between science and pseudoscience. But there was this other demarcation problem, which I call, uh, call the territorial demarcation problem, um, which tries to, uh, you know, find the divisions between science on the one hand and other forms of inquiry, other forms of knowledge that are not bad, but that are also legitimate in some way. So philosophy, for example, or uh, logic or metaphysics or everyday knowledge, something uh, like the stuff that my plumber does. Um, And so in a way, scientism, which is also a term of abuse, it's, well, or originally it, is something, it was something bad. It's some, the, the idea being that it's, that it's science being pushed too far or science overreaching uh, or science just intruding in certain domains where it's not, uh, where it doesn't have any authority. Uh, in a way, it's a counterpart of pseudoscience. Um, pseudoscience is a kind of, a, you know, lack of good science. It's, it's science falling short of uh, the, good, the standards of, of, of good science. And the idea of pseudoscience is in a way the opposite. It's science being pushed too far. And then the question of course becomes, well, uh, are there any instances of, of, uh, of scientism? Because to, to ask about scientism is implicitly to ask about the limits of science. Uh, if, uh, if, if scientism is in a way, science overstepping its limits, well, then, of course, you have first you have to figure out what, what those limits are. Um, now, I've come to believe, and this is not something that I was originally convinced of, but it's just something that uh, I, that's just slowly dawned on me as I was thinking about this more, is that um, this, the, the distinction between science or the scientific methods and other ways of knowing, every, everyday ways of knowing, is not so strict as I've, as I've believed in the past. Um, so initially, I think I, I had this belief that uh, there, w- there was this thing called, well, the scientific revolution. Of course, I still believe in the scientific revolution. Uh, but I, I no longer believe in the idea that there was kind of a radical break with the past, that as, as if somehow we suddenly discovered this scientific method that was, you know, completely different from everyday uh, 
ways of knowing, you know, everyday methods of of, uh, of inquiry, and 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 then all of a sudden, you know, we uh, obtain knowledge in all these different domains. What what I do think is, uh, well, first of all, that uh, science predates the scientific revolution, and you can see uh, already early forms of science in uh, Greek antiquity, for example. I think it's it's kind of artificial to say that, th that some of these Greeks were not doing science. I think, especially when you look at astronomy and physics, uh, they were really <laughs> very much doing the same thing. Um, so I, I'm now I believe more in a kind of very gradual um, definition of science from a historical point of view. If you talk about how science emerged from uh, everyday forms of knowledge, but also in a conceptual sense that, um, of course, you can give, you can come up with a list of characteristics of science. Uh, it's institutional, it's, it's often done in laboratories, it's funded by uh, organizations, it's, it's, it's using peer review. Uh, but those are more or less contingent features. Um, and when you look at the actual, like the, the, the epistemic features of science, the, the thing that a historian, for example, the stuff that a historian is doing or a physicist in, 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 in laboratory, as opposed to what a plumber is doing when he's trying to find a leak, it's not very different. Of course, the plumber is working alone. Scientists are often working together. Uh, the plumber is not publishing a result, its results in a journal. Because, I mean, who cares about my sink? It's only my sink. It's not this is like a general uh, question of, uh, of scientific interest. Um, so there, there are all sorts of uh, superficial differences. But when, it, but when it comes to the actual methods, just uh, coming up with hypotheses, uh, trying to rule rule out different uh, possibilities, uh, making logical inferences, uh, gathering more data, and uh, for example, I don't think that what the plumber is doing is really much different from what the scientist is doing. And I think even what a hunter-gatherer is doing, or was doing, let's say, 100,000 years ago, um, trying to track an animal, for example, just looking at uh, the imprints of a of a hoof for example and then figuring out how how fresh it is in what the direction the animal was running whether it was a you know a large animal or a small animal whatever all these kinds of inferences um it's actually a, a form of scientific investigation even though of course it was not institutionalized and and um and etc so there are also superficial similarities uh but i do but i do think that epistemically there's no crisp dividing line between everyday science and um, uh, between everyday uh, forms of knowledge and science. Science just gradually emerges out of these uh, everyday forms of knowledge. So uh, one philosopher that was really very, very influential, influential uh, for me in that regard was um, Quine, uh, Willard van Orman Quine. Um, who came was the first who came up with this metaphor of the web of knowledge. Um, so many philosophers think of knowledge in terms of a, of a, a building, like a building with a foundation. So you start with a secure foundation and then, and then you know, you build on, on top of that layer of <laughs> layer upon layer of bricks of whatever. Um, I think that's a misleading image of knowledge. Um, I think it's, it's much more interesting to think of knowledge in terms of a web, a web, where everything, well, uh, ideally hangs together and in which there are many interconnected strands. And uh, so when you ask what is the distinction between science and other disciplines like philosophy or logic or mathematics, um, I think it's, it's very hard to... Um, to figure out exactly where science ends and where philosophy begins, for example. And to, to some extent, it's not an interesting question. Um, I think philosophers uh, are way too hung up on this question of what is philosophy? What makes philosophy unique? What makes philosophy special? How can we approach a problem in a philosophical fashion as opposed to a scientific fashion? I mean, in a way, I say, who cares? It's a, if it's an interesting problem, just throw everything you have uh, against it. 
empirical methods, conceptual methods, etc., um, and uh, and try to resolve the problem in in you know in any way possible. So if you think about science in those terms as a as a web of knowledge that doesn't really have any clear subdivisions. Well, of course, you have institutional subdivisions because for administrative reasons, you, you need to have faculties and departments. And I mean, mm-hmm. when you're apply, applying for funding, you have to make up your mind, well, am I doing philosophy or am I doing physics? And, you know, so there, there are practical reasons to do that. But I don't think that uh, from an epistemic point of view, there, there's, a, there's a big difference. It's all, it's very, uh, it's very much interconnected and it's, 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 it's just shades into each other. Uh, good philosophy that is so for, for example when you think of philosophy I think good philosophy is very much informed by sciences uses empirical results um, and tries to you know build new strands or you know develop new strands within the overarching web of knowledge that's what good that's what good philosophy is supposed to be bad philosophy I think is often philosophy that is detached from the web uh, Philosophers who say, who are just sitting in an armchair and say, well, let us think about the nature of reality or, uh, you know, the structure of, a, uh, of, of, of the cosmos. And we don't care about physics because that's science and we just want to start from first principles, etc. When you're doing philosophy in that way, well, you're not going to be integrated in the web, but you're also going to be, bad, uh, going to be doing bad philosophy. Um, so, but coming back to your question about uh, scientism and, and the limits of science, if you think you know, uh, overarching web in which everything is interconnected, it becomes hard to make sense of clear limits of science. Um, and that's also what, why I wrote in, in one of my papers that oftentimes when people are using the word scientism, they, they, what they really want to say is that this is something, this is science that I don't like, or this is science that is intruding on a domain that is very special and very... Uh, valuable for me and I don't think scientists should uh, should have any uh, uh, you know should should have any business in that domain so for example uh, religious people will of course say well you shouldn't investigate miracles you shouldn't investigate the, the in, in, uh, existence of gods uh, or uh, or holy books or whatever because that's that's very like that's very special for us and uh, that's a different domain and science has no authority there. And if, uh, and if a scientist tries to investigate these questions, he's overstepping the limits of science and he's doing scientism. I'm saying, no, not really. I mean, if you're, uh, if you're, th- if you're thinking about it, uh, religion is also a kind of a hypothesis about reality. And the existence of God is a hypothesis, the hypothesis that there is this supernatural creator who is uh, responsible for everything that we see around us. In a way, you can treat it as a scientific hypothesis. You could you could try to think like like what would the world look like if we assumed that it was made by a by a creator, by an intelligent creator, by a benevolent intelligent creator. Um, now, another example in which the term scientism is often used is when, when um, for example, when uh, neurologists are investigating uh, things like love or friendship or consciousness, like these things that we. That are very that we that we hold dear and that we think are very special. Some people have the idea uh, that science, when science is trying to unravel those mysteries, that it's kind of uh, destroying those mysteries. Um, so uh, love is something that is mysterious and inexplicable, and 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 they don't like the idea of science you know, uh, examining, uh, of investigating, for example, the, the chemical basis of oxytocin and how it uh, relates to romantic love. And, and so, and this is often a context in which people will use the term scientist. But there again, I think it's, it's, it's just not a, it's not a legitimate phrase. It's per- perfectly proper for, for scientists to investigate love. And by the way, it doesn't destroy love at all. I mean, the, the, the phenomenal experience of love is no, is in no way diminished by knowing that it's, related for example to oxytocin so the only thing that i could think of uh, that i think deserves the label scientism um, is when scientists or, or some philosophers are doing that as well are making claims like science can establish the truth of certain moral values ah okay i was actually gonna um, ask that next question actually 
So yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. yeah, great. I was actually going to bring that in because you write about David Hume's Auden is and this fascinating thought from Sam Harris when he runs these um, neuroscans of the brain and, and believes that moral facts or other aspects may be able to be derived from these. So yes, please take us there because that was going to be my next question about that claim about moral facts. And many listeners will, again, be um, already... Uh, slightly introduced to this topic. So I'll certainly know what uh, uh, Hume was thinking when he said an ought and an is, but I might get to explain that briefly. But uh, where is, is Hume right? Because some people, of course, challenge him on this and say that he, he was confused. Um, and where is Sam Harris going wrong here? And why, of course, is this kind of behavior a scientism? Um, yeah, I, I'm on the side of Hume uh, on, in this discussion. So I, I, I do think that um, science can investigate descriptive uh, things. So everything about the universe, also even things like the existence of God, which is still a descriptive thing. It's just whether or not uh, a God exists, whether or not love for example um it's a western invention or is or, or is something that has deep evolutionary roots these are all kinds of descriptive things about what is or what is not that is what hume calls the the, the realm of of what is of the, the, so in this odd uh, distinction and then on the other hand we have the, uh, the the realm of what ought to be um and that is the question well is love a good thing uh i mean is it a, is it a good thing that god exists um is uh, homosexuality, for example, is that a good thing or should we condemn it because it's unnatural or all these kinds of things. When people are looking to science to find answer to these moral questions, I think they're making a leap that uh, is illegitimate. Well, uh, well, the case of homosexuality, I think it's, 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 a, it's pretty straightforward to, to, to drive home this point. It just because homosexuality is somehow well unnatural first of all it's not unnatural because it it it, uh, it appears uh, across the animal kingdom and in a lot of different species but even supposing that it is so, so let's say that hu human beings are the only species that engage in homosexuality would it therefore be wrong uh, to be gay or to engage in um, uh, homosexual acts no of course not because it's not because something is the way it is that it's supposed to be like that, that we ought to do it. So you cannot just uh, take uh, just uh, the existence of something or just the, the, the existence of a certain state of affairs as a, as a good grounds for making um, moral judgment, uh, judgments. So that was Hume's original point that um, you can talk a lot about what ought to be about moral questions um, but if you're talking about uh, uh, morality, you always need some moral premises. You need to start out for something like, okay, we think that suffering is bad, for example, or lying is bad, or some, some general rules. And then, of course, you can start out, you can even bring in some empirical knowledge about uh, what, uh, what causes suffering, for example, uh, how can we avoid suffering. But you always need to start from a moral premise. You cannot just derive your moral premises from the things uh, that science has uh, that investigated or that anyone like uh, more generally still, you cannot derive moral judgments directly from how the world happens to be. So now what a lot of people are doing, and this, this I think this, this deserves the label scientism, is, is that they think that science is also something very special is something that we didn't have before. And it gives us like a special kind of uh, insight into morality. So it gives us um, the means to establish the truth of certain moral facts, for example, that suffering is bad. So what people are, like Sam Harris is doing, uh, uh, are doing, is they're looking at um, especially neurological studies for uh, investigating the, uh, the neural basis of uh, pain experiences, suffering, uh, etc. And they're saying, look, we can see under a brain scanner, an uh, fMRI scanner, for example, that someone is in pain, someone is experiencing pain, 
And so we have established that pain is bad because we can see it under a scanner. There, I think that's, that's, a, that's a category mistake in, 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 in a way. First of all, I mean, we don't need an fMRI scanner to, to tell that someone is in pain. That's, that's just, that's like uh, granting some sort of special authority to science that, 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 we, that, that, that we couldn't have uh, by, by non-scientific means, which I think is a non-starter. Um, if someone, if like, if you hit someone with a hammer on a, on a stump and he's screaming, you can be pretty sure that he's in pain. You don't need an fMRI scanner to, uh, to tell you that. Um, but the fact that someone is in pain, wh- whether you discover it by everyday means or by, the, by, uh, by means of an fMRI scanner, still doesn't in- establish the fact that it would be that, that, that pain or suffering is somehow wrong. You still need a moral premise to do that. And the, the mistake, I think, on the part of people like Sam Harris is to think that science can achieve this leap from is to alt that Hume would think is impossible. So, so in, in a way, Sam Harris and Richard Carrier and, and a lot of other people are asking science to do the impossible. Um, they're asking science to make, to make this leap from, uh, from is to alt that uh, I think science cannot do. Also, other uh, ways of... Mm, knowing or other uh, uh, methods of knowing uh, cannot cannot achieve so it's not it's, it's not a limitation of science in a way it's it's a limitation of just um, of an of a logical nature that I think that was Hume's insight that it's uh, it, it doesn't matter how sophisticated your methods are to find out about uh, what is and what is not in the world uh, it will never allow you to uh, to make this leap into what ought to be. So to the extent that Sam Harris uh, wrongly thinks that it is possible to make that leap and that science and science alone can do that, I think um, he can be accused of scientism. So I think scientism is a, is a good word to describe what is happening there. But I should say it's one of the only instances I can think of where the use of the term scientism is really legitimate. In most cases, I think, uh, as I said, uh, it's used as an excuse for, yeah, uh, for science skepticism or for, you know, uh, turf protection. Like this is my domain, and you have to stay out, you scientists, with your probing methods, etc. Um, but when it comes to this, this is odd uh, barrier. I'm I'm on the side of Hume, and I think that. Um, I mean, science can do a lot of wonderful things, but when it cannot do, and what, what it will never be able to do is to establish moral truths. That's something that, that that's a, just a, that's a completely different universe. So that, it's also one of the only domains, I think, where there really is a crisp distinction. So I've been talking a lot about uh, gray mm-hmm. areas and intermediate cases when it comes to science versus pseudoscience, when it comes to science versus philosophy, uh, I think the world is often complicated, but here is one case in which the world is not complicated in the sense that you you, you can make a, a, a pretty crisp dividing line between what the things that are and the things that ought to be, and there's just no way to to cross that uh, by s- the scientific method or, or by any other method. So let's uh, take a step back to a less crisp line, another blurry line. And this is for another article of yours, a shorter one, but uh, not just interesting, but of course, incredibly pertinent concerning the times in which we live, or at least it appears so. And this is the question of conspiracy theories and the epistemology of them and, and why and how people believe these conspiracy theories. So you write, and this seems obvious to many people, they would say something like, we are living in an age of uh, conspiracy theories. But you're right, this is just not true when you look at it. Um, and of course, you, you go on to cite a number of people who say things like, no matter what great advance or change in the world, there's always going to be conspiracy theories coming up. And of course, you also write that there is um, a number of conspiracy theories that have, of course, been true. You, you quote the murder of Julius Caesar, the October Revolution, the Watergate break in and cover up. Um, so, importantly, here, uh, 
tell, tell us about the phenomena of conspiracy theories. Of course, uh, in your article, again, you say there's no bright line between them, but it seems to be one of those moments uh, very keen in popular culture these days where it seems to have, a lot of people have their minds on conspiracy, um, cons- conspiracy theories. So why, why do people believe and um, why is it appropriate sometimes that people do believe them? Yeah. Well, as you say, I mean, the most straightforward answer to the question why people believe in conspiracies or believe in anything for that matter is, of course, well, because it's real and it's only rational to believe things that are real. Uh, and it's the answer that the believer themselves will give you. And sometimes that answer is uh, perfectly appropriate when it comes to the Watergate scandal or the the murder of Julius Caesar. I mean, the question, why do you believe in these conspiracy theories is kind of, <laughs> I mean, it's... it's uh, it's it's pointless in a way, or at least it's 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 obvious because I mean these are documented cases of uh, of conspiracies, but then there's these other conspiracy theories, and conspiracy theory is not a term that is that has a normative dimension. Mostly, people use it to discredit certain beliefs and ideas. Uh, even people who believe that the moon landing was faked, for example, would not. Uh, call that a conspiracy theory exactly because they believe it to be true or rational and they and they actually implicitly they also adopt the negative connotation of the term conspiracy theory by saying no no no, this is not a conspiracy theory this this is actually real um so there's this class of irrational or unfounded or whatever you want to call them conspiracy theories um about all sorts of historical events in which despite any clear uh evidence of a genuine conspiracy, people believe that uh, the truth is out there and that uh, we've been lied to, etc. How do you define these uh, these theories? Well, it's uh, there's also you know a pretty substantial philosophical literature about that. Uh, but just to, to make things simple, um, I think conspiracy theories. Well, obviously they involve conspiracies, and conspiracies is or social events in which a small group of people. Uh, conspire together to esta- to achieve a certain goal, often with nefarious intentions. A birthday party could be seen as a conspiracy, but it's, but it's kind of a stretch because you know <laughs> there's nothing evil about a, about a birthday party. So it's a small group of people doing evil things and trying to remain hidden. It's, it's in the nature of a conspiracy, of course, that they, they don't want to be exposed. Uh, a conspiracy theory in the normative sense is an uh, unofficial account of historical events that involves conspiracies as I just defined them. And the interesting thing is that you can even have these conspiracy theories about historical events that already involve a genuine conspiracy. So for example, 9-11, if you think about it, uh, the official account of 9-11, the account that I also believe, uh, and that I think is rational to believe, involves a conspiracy because Al-Qaeda was a, well, yeah, it was a secret organization, but it was a, an organization that was uh, devising a secret plan to stage a terrorist attack against the uh, United States, and that was trying to remain hidden. They, did, they didn't want their plan to be exposed. So by definition, that is a conspiracy theory. Uh, sorry, that is, that is a, a conspiracy. But even historical events that already involve a conspiracy uh, can be the subject, and this is always, this is the core of conspiracy theories, whatever we've been told in the media and by official authorities and by uh, scientific organizations and by, the, uh, you know, um, by uh, 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 official experts is a big lie. We've been lied to on a massive scale. Uh, the official story is just a cover-up. It's something that has been invented by the people who are really pulling the strings behind the scenes. And it's a cover story for something that is far more sinister and dark. And so applied to the case of 9-11, what people would say, no, Al-Qaeda is just like a convenient culprit that's, uh, you know, that is just a cover story that was invented by the real people who were responsible for for, for these attacks. Uh, and that could be the U.S. government or, uh, or the Illuminati or the Jews or whatever. Uh, so any kind of uh, other uh, group that could be responsible for these things. Okay, so that's more or less what a conspiracy theory is. Uh, and then the question defined 
as such, are we living in the age of conspiracy theories or conspiracy theories on the rise? Um, surprisingly, perhaps uh, to, to some people, there's not really good, ev uh, good evidence that conspiracy theories are more, uh, more popular than they used to be. Um, so obviously some conspiracy theories are new. Well, by definition, we didn't have 9-11 conspiracy theories before 9-11 happens. Uh, so that's, that's pretty obvious. But, but if you measure conspiracy theories in general about major world events, then you'll see that 20 years ago, 100 years ago, you also had these theories that we can identify as conspiracy theories, even though the, perhaps the concepts of the term didn't uh, exist back then. The term is relatively recent. I think, um, I'm not sure, but it could be post-World War II when the, 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 the term conspiracy theory with its negative connotation really uh, took off. But when you look at um, the conspiracy theory, which is perhaps the most infamous and uh, detrimental conspiracy protocols of the elders of Zion, uh, it's a it's a forged document dating from uh, Tsarist Russia in the 19th century, uh, purporting to be uh, an, an an report of a secret uh, conference by Jewish people um, who were devising a plan for world domination, and so it lays out their uh, their plans, etc. It's it's fake. It's it's you know it's completely uh, it's completely bullshit. Um, but it was taken very seriously by a lot of people, including uh, the Nazi Party. So, so many people in the Nazi Party, you know, uh, touted this document as a as as proof that uh, international Jewry was a really dangerous thing. Um, so that's about a hundred years ago. Um, even though perhaps the term conspiracy conceptually, psychologically, sociologically to conspiracy theories about 9-11, uh, for example, or about the murder of JFK, uh, et cetera. You can go further still. Uh, the one uh, famous conspiracy theory in the Middle Ages was the idea also that the Jews were responsible for the, for the plague, for the bubonic plague. There was this idea that the Jews had secretly poisoned uh, the wells so that they, people believed that... Uh, that the, the, the disease was caused by, uh, by poisoned water somehow. And so there was this conspiracy theory that the Jews were behind it. So I think there, uh, we don't live in the age of conspiracy theories in the sense that there, there have always been conspiracy theories. And then, of course, the question is, well, why is this so? Why, why have there always been unfounded, irrational ideas about, conspiracy, uh, about, uh, about conspiracies? And I think it's something to do, on the one hand, with the makeup of the human mind. So there are psychological reasons why people uh, are susceptible to these kinds of conspiratorial explanations. Uh, I can talk a little bit about that, but uh, what I'm more interested in is actually the, the epistemological reasons. Uh, I'm a philosopher, after all, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm interested in, in knowledge and, and, and about uh, uh, what, you know, the conceptual structure of certain theories. And the interesting thing about all conspiracy theories, uh, so the one about the, the, the Jews in the Middle Ages, the one about the, the protocols of the elders of Zion, about the murder of GFK, about 9-11, um, have this very special and possibly unique feature that they are the only theories that predict an absence of evidence in their favor. So... Um, assuming that 9-11 was an inside job, for example, by, carried out by, by the Bush uh, administration, and assuming that the, cons uh, the conspirators uh, were very powerful and intelligent, as they are, I mean, you know, it's a US government after all, um, you wouldn't expect to find any clear evidence of this conspiracy, because after all, they have been covering up their tracks. Stronger still, you would even expect to find some counter evidence for the conspiracy. They may have planted false evidence, for example, for a cover-up story 
involving Al Qaeda um, or you know, some other um, cover up story. And um, so, in a way, you would even expect to find refutations of your theory. And this is something that uh, you often see when you debate conspiracy theorists is that uh, any kind of counter evidence that you throw at them backfires because they would say things like, well, of course, that's what they want you to believe. Well, of course, uh, we, we would expect to find this kind of evidence because they're trying to throw us off the scent. Uh, after the 9-11 the, the, the Commission uh, published it, it, its report, of course, it didn't impress the conspiracy theorists at all because they said, well, it, the American government, I mean, what, what did you expect? Of course, they're going to come up with a, an explanation that, uh, that supports the official version because but, but it's all, all, all the evidence has just been fabricated, etc. So uh, in, in this recent paper that I uh, wrote, I um, make this analogy between conspiracy theories uh, and black holes, uh, black holes, the, you know, the well-known uh, astronomical objects that have such a strong gravitational force that even light cannot escape uh, from it and that uh, everything that has um, fallen into, uh, into it never escapes again, and hence the name uh, black hole. And so uh, conspiracy theories can be regarded in a way as a kind of a black hole uh, in the same sense, because once you start to assume that um, nothing is as it seems and that everything that you see around you is, uh, is a cover-up story for something far more sinister and that there's these people behind the scenes that are very powerful and very intelligent who have the means to cover up their tracks and even to fabricate false evidence, then nothing can shake you out of your conviction. Uh, so, so, so it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a trap that you fall into and once you're, you know, you're trapped in that in that belief system, it's very difficult to reason your way out of it, uh, because you can explain away every uh, possible form of uh, counter evidence. So again, it's a very Popperian idea, and it's not a coincidence that Popper also wrote about conspiracy theories, uh, because conspiracy theories are perhaps the only theories that are intrinsically unfalsifiable. You don't, need, you don't even have to come up with ad hoc moves or anything like that. It's just the, the, the very structure of the theory makes it almost impossible uh, to falsify. And that is exactly what makes them so attractive to, uh, to a lot of people. Let's uh, take a step from that. So that was such an interesting look into conspiracy theories and, and the like, because the, I must ask a couple of final questions here. I must keep it a little longer because this... Um, Again, for, uh, this is, a, I think this is a very uh, interesting way to end the podcast on with a couple of questions along these different lines of, uh, and again, another article that you wrote, um, and this is titled Truth and Consequences When It's Rational to Accept Falsehoods. And this is something that I found particularly interesting. Now, I, I might start with the first question. I think many people might be confused by the title of that. And you write, um, you give a couple of an, a, uh, first examples, and I might run through them quickly here. You talk about a, an old woman who's dying and thinks her son is a, um, a wonderful ph uh, philanthropist. And in fact, he's a drug lord or a mafia boss. And you say, in the yeah. case of this, there's a, a chance of a positive il um, illusion where it, it might just be rational to con continue to believe it. And many people may not have any challenges with that. But then there's another one here. And I thought this is interesting. You talk about um, ulcers and uh, the, 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 so the, in ulcers in people's stomachs. And uh, not that long ago, the treatment for ulcers, people used to think they were caused by stress, so the treatment should be stress reduction. And um, then you go on to imagine that, of course, they, of course, this was wrong. And you go on to imagine that even if it was wrong and even if it had been um, examined and you could show that it was wrong, it still wouldn't be reasonable for a, a lay person to challenge their doctor on this in some ways. And it comes back to this fascinating question about the costs of belief. And uh, you write, any divergence between rational and accuracy would depend on the costs associated. 
So when you form a belief of it of any sort, it demands something from you, it grabs something from you, it demands resources, it demands that you act on a personal belief. It, it comes at a heavy cost. So I might start there and then afterwards we can jump into nationalism. Yeah, that's right. So um, beliefs are, um, are are pretty persistent. That's the, the, the you know that's that's something to, that, that we have to start with. Um, an, an idea that I really like in philosophy it's it's a very uh, fancy name. Is this uh, idea of doxastic involuntarism? It's the idea that we don't choose our beliefs. Uh, they impose themselves on us. We, we, we can't decide to believe, for example, uh, that, you know, that, 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 that the sun will not rise tomorrow because we know that there's no reason to believe that. And even if, even if we were threatened by someone, you know, you have to believe this now or I'll, you know, someone put a pistol to my head or something like that. You can't do it. Um, so um, beliefs are, you know, can be very stubborn and they can also be costly. So you have to be careful about what evidence that you expose yourself to, because once you have been exposed to the evidence, it's very hard to get rid of a belief and a belief might have downsides. So we talked in the paper about uh, two types of costs. You have acquisition costs and possession costs. The acquisition cost is basically uh, the costs of uh, you know, acquiring more accurate information. In the case of the ulcer, well, of course, you could, you could trust your doctor that's not expensive. That's just taking somebody's uh, authority. He's a medical authority. So why, why wouldn't you just go along with him? Um, you can, of course, go do your own research uh, and try to find out if your doctor may be wrong, but that's costly. Um, so in a way, sometimes it's optimal to stick with the belief that might be untrue, might be inaccurate, because it's just too costly to find, um, uh, you know, to find more about it. That's perhaps the more straightforward costs of uh, associated with belief. But what is even more interesting is that the very possession of a belief can also have downsides. So even if a belief comes completely for free, you don't have to do the research, you don't have to you know, make a lot of effort. Here you have the belief, you have the evidence. Uh, it might still have downsides in the sense, for example, that it might make you unhappy or that it might... Um, it might force you into a situation in which, for example, you have to, you have to lie to everyone. Uh, and this is where the example of, of, of nationalism uh, comes in. So what we're trying to ex explore in the paper is that um, by and large, of course, we want to have true beliefs because beliefs guide action. And it might be, if I believe that I can fly and I really believe that I, I might jump out of a window and of course, that might have very uh, serious consequences. So most of the time we want to have true beliefs, but sometimes true beliefs uh, can also be costly. And in these situations, you're kind of facing a dilemma. Do I want to be exposed to the truth, even if the truth is, uh, is uh, inconvenient, disturbing, might actually make me depressed or unhappy, um, or might ca cause a lot of stress or do I uh, do I adopt this belief that even though it is untrue uh, has all sorts of psychological or social uh, benefits and so well the deathbed scenario is, is, is one famous example in which well do you really want to expose someone to the truth when it doesn't really matter anymore and when you're only, when this true belief, when the only effect of this true belief is that it will make someone miserable, um, perhaps not. I mean, I, I have to, that it, it, in, to, in a lot of respects, I think I'm kind of a truth fundamentalist in the sense that for myself, at least, um, I want to have true beliefs, even if the truth is disturbing, because I think in the long run, true beliefs will always, uh, in, uh, when always win out in a way, in, in a way that there might be short-term uh, downsides, uh, but in the long run, I think um, illusions can be dangerous. The interesting thing about the bath, the death bath scenario, of course, is that there is no long run. It doesn't matter anymore. I mean, it might be dangerous to believe that your son is a is a, is a wonderful philanthropist, for example, 
when you're still alive because because then the the the, the threat is always looming that you, you might be suddenly exposed to this uh to this to the to the horrible truth and your world will be shattered but that that no longer applies with the de- with the deathbed uh scenario but because there it's just you know you can die peacefully and it de- and why, why would you want to uh, to burden someone uh, with that belief um but i think in a lot of other examples i think it's always better to have true beliefs, even even if false beliefs may, may, uh, may make you happy, even if the truth may be disturbing. And the interesting paper, uh, the interesting thing about the, the paper that I wrote together with uh, Tanner Adis, who's a, who's a, who's a f- physicist, uh, is that uh, we were kind of, um, our, our positions were a little bit in tension in the sense that he was more sympathetic to the idea that uh, some illusions are beneficial. And I was more leaning towards the, the, the true fundamentalism. Uh, and so, and the way we, we resolved that tension was to come up with a couple of different scenarios. And I think that that's, you know, uh, that, that's w- what made the paper interesting that we're uh, challenging each other's uh, uh, assumptions in a way and see if we could come up with scenarios where the, the truth would be better or illusion would be better. And then, yeah, the nationalism example is, is also, uh, Perhaps we can talk about that. Yeah, a so more. Th- yeah. Let's, let's, let's jump in as a last question here. Let's jump into the national liberalism example. And uh, of course, I'm going to link below the podcast the articles I've been using here, but I do encourage people to go and read this one because this nationalism example runs for, I think, five or six pages and keeps coming back. And it, it was really fascinating to read through it. So I'll start with uh, a little bit of the story here and uh, I'll let you open it up here. So it starts with a, um, a thought experiment. So two countries, two uh, fictional countries, Turania and uh, Ur. Oratia, Ur- I believe it is. And uh, yeah. so both are small countries. And uh, so we'll start with uh, Turania. And Turania, the ethnic group is the Turans. It's a small, it, it's a, the dominant ethnic group. And uh, these two countries neighbor each each other. Within um, Turania, there is, is a small um, ethnic minority of uh, Urtats or of the, of the neighboring country. And this is the same for both countries on either side. So you can begin to see similarities with conflict zones around the world already yeah. here. And uh, this national and the story runs like this. There's a highly partisan story and a highly nationalist story that's built up in each side. And it basically says that uh, the other side are villains and they can't be trusted. And uh, it, is the, um, it is our Turanian dynasty and it's our um, founder of our country who is, who is protecting us and keeping us from treachery and uh, massacres, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go on to write about just, and then you think, have this second thought experiment of this young lady, this young woman in the country who, um, and she, and she grows up within this environment. So she's taught this thing in school and you have a couple of questions and I'm going to go with some of them here. And you say, first, imagine the acquisition costs of her, um, finding flaws in the standard model here, the standard story. First, perhaps you'd have to walk into a dissident bookshop, find a translation, which would be hard to do. And, um, uh, uh, Secondly, once she, pre- if she did discover this knowledge, it would come at huge cost she, because her the whole uh, Turanian society has been told to be vigilant against people and fellow citizens who have lackluster examples and affirmations of this nationalism. So she'd soon be found out. So maybe she could lie. But of course, you go on to say lying has huge costs too. Not just it's hard to do, it's tricky, it's it, it, it sharp in her behavior, but yeah. it also has huge stress implications for the person person involved as well and it continues and continues and it's such an interesting um thought experiment here and i, I want to bring one last uh, thought here that um and that y- you you add here that it's actually in some ways helpful for the Turanian state for its nationalism to be uh, slightly false in a way, because if it was all true, then commitment to the uh, nationalism story, it wouldn't be remarkable. But because it is yeah. slightly false, then you can actually test society's loyalty to you. How willing are they to believe the falsehood? So I've thrown a lot at you there, but it's such an interesting um, thought about nationalism. So take us there and uh, those acquisition costs and just how challenging this nationalism and nationalistic story is. Yeah, you're, you're right that in a way... Um only false beliefs 
can serve this function of uh, be you know displays of loyalty, uh, and it's it's a kind of a it's a fine balance that you have to strike because on the one hand something that's blatantly false probably wouldn't serve that function because you would you know you would have to be a lunatic to believe that the Earth is flat, for example. Even though I mean there, there are people who believe that the Earth is flat. Um, something that is obviously true is also I mean. Uh, doesn't take any effort to believe it, and again, uh, will not um, f- will not function well as a as a, as a as a loyalty signaling uh, belief. But something that is slightly false, something that is a little bit exaggerated, like, takes a little effort uh, on the part of uh, of believer, a little a little my side bias, like our side is the good side and the other sides are villains, might actually be socially uh, wholesome in the sense that it uh, fosters uh, social cohesion, uh, etc. Now, the interesting thing about that, and that this is something that applies to uh, beneficial beliefs in general, is that for the people th- from the insider's view, the people who believe these things, they cannot reason their way through what I'm saying now. Because, I mean, putting the question like this already assumes that, that we realize that it's a false belief. Um, so you could, you could say, well, on balance, uh, the false belief doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have big downsides because it doesn't lead to dangerous courses of action on the other side, you know, it's good for to fostering, uh, social cohesion, etc. You could, you could make these kind of assessments from an outsider's, uh, perspective and say, you know, they're doing pretty fine, but from the insides, uh, insider's perspective, it's hard to, to make that evaluation because by by the very act of making that evaluation, you would you would kind of puncture your illusion, and you would see that it's it's false. And uh, and this is again the the, the problem of uh, uh, doxastic involuntarism. Suppose that you do find out somehow that it's that it's a lie, or at least uh, that that it's, it's it's a false account of history because you stumble upon a, a book in a dissident bookshop, etc. It's very hard to go back, even. Let's say that you that that you uh, you're exposed to that belief, and you are convinced that no, actually it was a good thing that I believed this false account, this 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 illusion because it's it makes my society better, etc. Even then, it's hard to go back. So there's a kind of what we call a, a doxastic catch twenty two uh, in the evaluation of any kind of uh, uh, positive illusion, is that uh, there are many situations in where you can come up with uh, a belief that is uh, has psychological benefits or social benefits. Um, but the tricky thing is that in order for it to work, in order for the belief to have these kind of benefits, the, 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 uh, the believers themselves cannot make these kinds of evaluation because that would defeat the purpose. Uh, so this is, it's fascinating, of course, that uh, how, the, how these kinds of things develop uh, I, I also have an interest in, in cultural evolution and in mimetic evolution and in uh, the ways in which belief systems, for example, can develop functions, useful uh, functions that are, um, that are inaccessible to the believers themselves. And that is a, that, that is a very fascinating thing because to, to ask the question about the function of your belief in a certain way uh, doesn't make any sense to the, to the believer himself. If you if you generally believe something, you believe something because it's true. You you w- once you start asking the question, well, does my belief serve a social function? You're kind of undermining your belief, mm. and so you can't do that. It's a very difficult psychological uh, like balance that you have to that you have to strike. Um, so that's what I found interesting about the, 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 the nationalist example. Is, is we, we could have made, I think, a similar examples about, about for example, religious beliefs um, or about just, uh, there's also an idea in psychology that uh, depressed people, so people who are clinically depressed, actually have a more accurate assessment of their own uh, their own talents and uh, and flaws and shortcomings, etc. Than people who are healthy, because there are certain positive illusions that are uh, conducive to mental health. And once you lose those illusions, so once you uh, 
once the, those illusions are exposed in a way uh, and you're confronted with the truth about yourself, <laughs> then you become depressed. It's a, but again, um, engaging in the kind of reasoning about how, I mean, what level of positive illusion about myself is actually uh, beneficial is very paradoxical. I mean, on the one hand, of course, you don't want to become totally delusional. You don't want to have delusions of grandeur. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, perhaps if you are, um, uh, if you're being completely truthful with yourself, it will, it will make you unhappy. So you have to strike a balance somewhere. You could, so there's all these research that shows, for example, that 90% uh, of people believe that they are better than average drivers. 90% of teachers believe that they're better than average uh, teachers. I mean, most of these people are not delusional. They, they, they don't believe that they're the best teacher of the country, for example. That would be delusional. On the other hand, they are slightly <laughs> well, d d uh, delusional or they, they, uh, uh, they are slightly untruthful with themselves in the sense that they overestimate their own uh, abilities. And from an outsider's perspective, from the perspective of a psychologist, you could say, okay, well, this is, this is good for you to engage in this kind of illusion. Uh, but that's the outsider's perspective. From the insider's perspective, it's hard, very hard to make that assessment uh, without, without defeating the purpose, without losing the illusion that is serving you so well. That is a, a, uh, a wonderful place to leave the podcast on. And of course, people listening may sense my pregnant pause there at the end because there is so much here. I, I've said this before in other podcasts, but it's never been truer here that there is so much more that we could have touched on here. And we had to ask, I had to ask single questions about whole papers at some points during the podcast because it was so much to get to. But in, I did about two weeks of reading of uh, Martin's work before this podcast and uh, it wasn't just interesting philosophically I, I and I don't just think that I've improved my thinking about Popper and the demarcation problem and pseudoscience etc but it was also incredibly fun it's a very readable type of writing and I'm going to link all those articles below for listeners and I really can't encourage uh, you all enough to go and read them for yourselves and uh, on that as well, Martin Baudry, thanks for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It was a very enjoyable discussion. And yeah, we, we, we could go on for hours. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, we, uh, yeah it, was, it, was, it was great to, uh, to be a guest on, on your podcast. So thanks for inviting me.